have a feeling we'll have more people coming in as they wrap up lunch. So this panel is about data and how data can help build your brand. And a lot of times you really don't really think of those two things together. Branding usually is something from the marketing department and from the art department and the people that help make pretty pictures. But really there's a lot that can be gleaned from data to help you make the right decisions about your brand. If you don't pay attention to the data, you could make a decision that's gonna cost you money. You may choose to brand your product in a way that maybe isn't what people are currently gravitating to or buying. So it really is something that you want to pay attention to. This panel is sponsored by Akerna. You may know them by their former name, MJ Freeway. They recently went public this year, had a really successful IPO. I'm going to be moderating this panel. Joining me is Jeanette Horton from MJ Freeway slash Akerna. I have the hardest time getting used to calling it Akerna. Me too. And Gordon Wade, uh, well, and, and of course, MJ Free, I'm sure you guys already know who they are, seed to sale tracking. Uh, they work with dispensaries, they work with producers, uh, so everyone really knows them very well. And then joining us is Gordon Wade from a company called Solo Sciences. And what his company does, and I'm sure he can give you a better description, but what his company does is basically assure the co consumer that the product that they're buying is actually the product that they're buying. And I, I think it's really especially more important today than ever because, again, I, I think one of our earlier panels talked about the vaping issue that we've heard of uh, with all the people getting sick and, and having so many problems. And a lot of uh, what I've read is that it's been traced to products that weren't what people thought they were buying. And I know that I've heard there's a lot of counterfeit um, action going on in the market as well in cannabis. And so it's really more critical now than ever that consumers know that the package that they're buying is actually the package that they're buying. So without further ado. Um, you know, I think uh, we'll start it off with, uh, really with, with you, Jeanette, as far as explaining to our audience what I you know, was doing very awkwardly about the, the critical role of data for brands, because you're on the front line, so you can tell them why it's so important. I mean, what you're doing with your data to help brands. Yeah, um, I'll start with what we're doing with our data to help brands, and I'll um, just give you a sense of what kind of data we're talking about. So uh, as a seed to sale tracking company, we collect uh, data across the supply chain from seed to sale. and. Um, Listening to the last panel and thinking about the conversational brands that we've had, I thought I'd narrow in on the kind of data we collect at retail. We also collect data at cultivation and we collect data from manufacturing that can give you a lot of interesting information about cost and margins and vendor performance and the right um, uh, formulas to put into your machines and get that all dialed in. But we're going to focus on retail because I think that makes the most sense for, for the brands and for the dialogue that we've got uh, today and have heard this morning. At retail, we collect data in two buckets. We collect, or I like to think of it in kind of two categories. We collect product data and we collect consumer data. And that's unique for us as a, a seed to sell software. A Kerner MJ, MJ platform, the name of our brand, does collect a lot of consumer data, which is critical for brands to make good decisions about the kind of products they're going to bring to market, about how they're going to um, adjust their products to meet consumer need and to meet where the kind of the hockey puck is going, not where it is today. So product data that we collect, we collect brand information, we collect information about milligrams, we collect information about flavors, um, if it's chocolates or you know, particular, like get down to what chocolates are selling more than other chocolates, what flavors do better than other flavors. Uh, we collect that at the individual product level, but also at the category level. Uh, we collect on consumer's age, zip code, gender. Uh, we can track a consumer uniquely, so we know how often they return, we know what they buy, when they buy it, how much they buy. It can tell you how profitable a certain consumer segment is over another segment. So there's a lot you can learn in that data. Uh, you get velocity in turns with product data, so what moves the fastest, what's got the best gross margin. There's so much to learn in that retail data and so much we concretely know versus are guessing at when we use the retail data. 
We've got about 10 years worth. It gives us a lot of history, and we've got great, great coverage across the U.S. to really understand what's happening with consumers and what they're buying. And I would love to kick it to Gordon to actually answer the second part of your question, Deborah, which is how do brands use data? Um, just given Gordon's background, really working with brands outside of cannabis and helping them use data, because I think that's where we're going. We don't use it enough in cannabis to make good data-driven decisions. And um, Gordon can talk about kind of what's best practice outside of cannabis. My name is Gordon Wade. I am a uh, consumer products expert. Um, I created, along with two other guys, the uh, principal process that's used by every major retailer and every major manufacturer on a global basis. Uh, the process is called category management, and my role was to uh, assemble the data that was needed in each step of the process uh, to provide the metrics uh, that people could utilize to build plans between manufacturers and retailers uh, for any given category for any given retailer. And in the process, um, uh, I've accumulated a lot of knowledge about uh, data. Uh, the entrepreneur who's the founder of uh, Solo Sciences, Alex Shaw, who's here in the audience, uh, and I worked together uh, 25 years ago uh, when we worked on this particular uh, the category management discipline I just mentioned. And Alex asked me to uh, come back and uh, help him in Solo Sciences uh, in uh, creating uh, the sense of trust uh, and the sense of credibility uh, that you need about your brand. Uh, people, we've used the word brand a lot, and, and nobody's uh, at, at this point in time talked about what is a brand. A brand is basically a promise. It's a promise that you, that you as a shopper, as a doctor, uh, as a, a consumer, is going to get the experience that you want, the experience uh, physically, uh, the experience emotionally that you want. The, this particular industry has, as we've discussed this morning, has suffered from counterfeiting, it's suffered from uh, people not measuring up to that promise. Uh, and what Solar Sciences is, is determined to do is to take the kind of data uh, that Jeanette was talking about, that uh, MJ Freeway slash Akerna uh, captures, uh, and, and augment that with other data such that you will be able aspirationally to accumulate the data that is used in CPG. And <clears throat> without going into a long baffle gab about what that is, it's basically who buys the product, what are they buying, that is to say flares, flavors, uh, level of, of uh, impact, le level of, of, of uh, power, uh, where are they buying it, when are they buying it, why are they buying it, how are we influencing, all those things that Jeanette was talking about. That, that creates a taxonomy for a product, and the more of that you have, the more you can, uh, uh, you, you can use to build your brand. Data is to brand building what air is to the human body. You cannot build a brand without data. And the more of it you have, the more accurate you, you have, uh, the better off you'll be. Solo, what Solo Sciences does in its collaboration uh, with uh, Akerna, and I would urge you um, to Google an article that was in the Salt Lake City Tribune about the collaboration between Akerna and uh, Solo Sciences uh, in medical marijuana in uh, Utah, because that really represents the future. future. You know what uh, MJ Freeway slash Akerna uh, does, which Janet just recited, what we at Solo Sciences do is we put on the package uh, a, a, an icon, uh, what we call a quasar, which has a code on it. The shopper or the consumer or the doctor or the retailer has an app which they download on their cell phone, and using this app, the app has a single code on it by, by, uh, by surfing over so that the app is pointed at the quasar, it will confirm that the product is 
what it says to be, be it was manufactured by who manufactured it under the conditions in which manufactured. In other words, it creates a, a sense of, uh, of, of confidence and trust, which is really what a brand promise is about. We'll talk more about that as we go on. Do you have a specific case study of how data has been used to grow a brand? Sure. Um, I'm going to use a consumer product category most of you are familiar with. Uh, it, it will be something, uh, the, the little K-cups that go into a Keurig machine and makes coffee. Uh, when, uh, if you go into a store, or if you went into a store a number of years ago, what you would have seen is um, six or seven brands uh, with multiple flavors, with and without caffeine, at various prices, with various, um, what I might call brand heritage. Maxwell House had one, uh, uh, your good friends of mine at Folgers and Pro Proctor had one, and there were many other brands. What happened was that the more sophisticated brand builders began to capture the data so that they could understand, in much the same way that the uh, young woman talked about uh, here where she was talking about the uh, amount of product that was bought, the, the heavy user, so to speak. And with that data, they were able to understand the level of loyalty to brands, to flavors, to other attributes. Uh, att an attribute is something like a flavor, could be a brand, could be uh, a, a, an ingredient or lack thereof, could be a particular um, uh, level of, of power uh, in, with the amount of caffeine in the product, etc. So what the brand builders were able to do uh, was to ascertain who was loyal to what and why. They were able to ascertain who was uh, exclusively loyal to a specific attribute, for example. And with that, they were able to go to the retailer and say, why are you carrying seven flavors of uh, vanilla uh, coffee K cup. You don't need seven flavors at the same price point. You only need one because con the consumer will switch between this, this brand and this brand, that flavor and that flavor, but they will, they will be loyal to XYZ. So if you have this particular attribute on the shelf, uh, that's all you need that represents that particular attribute. So what happened was the retailers began to realize they didn't have to have uh, hundreds of dollars invested in uh, non-moving inventory uh, with this particular characteristic or attribute that they could narrow their, um, their, their assortment, so to speak, uh, and thereby, A, reduce, the, uh, reduce their inventory, increase their product turn. There's various mathematical, uh, I'm your, your basic math nerd, so it, there's calculations you can do on velocity uh, one of the principal ones called Gemroy, gross margin return on inventory investment. Uh, by the way, I'm going to be wandering around here like a you know, helpless old man, so just come up to me afterwards and I'll try to explain some of this baffle gab I give you here because I'm, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be drinking out of a fire hose here with me. So, any rate, uh, this Gemroy capability, Gemroy, Gemroy metric can be utilized to help the retailer turn his inventory and become much more uh, profitable. So, one way to build your brand is to know who is buying it, who the heavy users are buying, what's the attribute the heavy user is buying, and utilize that, leverage that to uh, A, uh, modify your own brand assortment, and more than, and much importantly also, or as importantly, con convey that information to the retailer so that the retailer uh, can winnow their assortment uh, to generate more profitability. That's what category management is. That's why uh, Alex Shaw asked me to come back, because we want to apply this to, uh, <clears throat> to your business while we give the shopper the confidence that they are getting uh, the product that they want uh, w with the uh, in, with the level of uh, functionality they desire, et cetera. I, if you don't mind me interjecting, I came from Coca-Cola. I can vouch for what Gordon is saying. I hadn't met him till recently, but those are the practices that we use. That's the science that we looked at when we analyzed data and we analyzed 
um, what we had on the shelf and how quickly it was turning and how profitable that was. And for it really boils down to data, or comes back to the data. Whatever math you apply to it, you have to start with your base of data. And I like to think of it as either a laser or a crystal ball. So in Gordon's examples, you've got a crystal ball that tells you can looks into the future and tells you what's happening. Um, but then you've also got a laser that pinpoints what's not working and where do you have the most opportunity. Um, and you can in your head get guesses or have gut feelings or you've scaled to a place where you just don't have a line of sight into everything. And so you've got the data that gives you the future predictions as well as the laser focus on what's happening now that you could fix or improve. I, I think sometimes what happens in the cannabis industry is so many companies begin as startups with people that um, have an idea and they just take it and run with it, uh, maybe without doing some of that homework and doing a little bit of research first. I know someone had, uh, that I knew had created this smoking accessory and, I, and had spent a ton of money on an industrial designer and because she just particularly liked this way of consuming cannabis. And I remember when she was, I was having this conversation, I'm a journalist and I was getting pitched this, this story and I, I remember thinking in my head the whole time that this pitch is coming to me about this wonderful smoking accessory and how it was quite expensive. They had gotten this very fancy industrial designer and the whole time I'm thinking, yeah, but nobody really consumes cannabis that way. I know it's not just me, but I'm sitting here thinking, that's a crazy idea. And it never went anywhere, and I, and I know she lost a ton of money. And I, I can't help but think, had she stopped and invested her time and money more in, is this a really good market to go in versus spending all that time and money on that industrial designer, she would not have wasted so much of her investment dollars into a product that basically failed because she really didn't take the time. And I wonder if that's maybe one of the issues that we have in the cannabis industry is companies are, are so many of them are bootstrapped that they feel like they don't have the money to pay for this type of thing, but it could become a very expensive mistake to not invest that money, right? Oh, I, I'm sorry. This industry is a big uh, problem with fragmentation. I mean, it doesn't, there'll be no charge for this consulting insight, but this industry has to consolidate. Uh, there, you, just, you just can't continue with this uh, selling county by county. I heard the one lady talk about selling a specific county. Uh, late flash, there are 3,200 counties in the United States. Uh, there are a lot of people out there you've got to reach. It takes money and takes time. Um, I, I wanted to go back to the issue of brand equity just briefly. Um, there's a, a book written by a gentleman named Kevin Lane Keller. You can Google it. And he talks about the issue of brand equity models. How do you, how do you build equity with a brand? What are the characteristics and what are the, what's a mathematical or characteristic model that you should use? There are many of these, probably uh, 10 to 15 models that exist, and there are two or three that have been used for years. One of the most important ones is something called the brand asset valuator uh, that was developed by Young and Rubicon, the advertising agency named Young and Rubicon a million years ago. And all of these models, in one way or another, say the same thing, that brand equity is really built by uniqueness or distinctiveness, that if you can create a distinctive product, you win. And uh, there's even been a study done by uh, a uh, Spencer Stewart, which is a an economic consulting outfit, which uh, compared the value of a brand in the marketplace <clears throat> to its brand equity as measured by the brand equity model, and basically proved that uh, the uh, economic value added, which is the Stern Stewart metric, uh, was directly uh, tied to this whole sense of uniqueness. So uniqueness is what you're striving for, as one of the, uh, one of the several of the people up here in the, in the previous uh, panel mentioned how unique they were and how they tried to be unique, and that's, that's certainly uh, the objective. And I would add to that uniqueness with a market. So Deborah gave the story of a woman's vape device that was obviously very unique. It's how she liked to smoke, but it didn't align with any segment in the market. And it, when we were listening to the past panel and they were talking about uniqueness, I thought about that challenge. 
especially with chocolates. Defonce was up here and they were early to the market and that's lucky for them. It's a highly saturated market, chocolate edibles. And so how do you create something unique? And for me, the answer is if you're, if you're really interested in getting into chocolate edibles or gummy edibles or another category that's highly saturated, find the growing market segment that's small but growing or find the small market segment that's still large enough to be profitable, and again, that's where data is. And you say, and so an example, senior women is a fast growing, and they're a highly capitalized, they've got a lot of income to spend, market, and I don't see a lot of products marketed to them. So if you were interested in bringing a category of edible, another subcategory of edible to the market, and you're trying to find yourself to be unique, perhaps that's a market. Maybe that's not your market. Maybe there's another fast growing market, but that's something else you can do with data is figure out how do I make a unique product that still matches to a market? And if you can find a market that's yet underserved, data is that laser that shows you where, where to go. Well, I, I, I feel that there's some a kernel, of, a kernel of nugget of information there. Sorry. Thanks, <laughs> um, Deborah. <laughs> um, so you know what? I digress. I have to take a moment here because... Um, I had asked um, Jessica Billingsley, who's the CEO of Akerna, I said, I, you know, you, what's up with the name? What, I don't understand this. And she had explained to me that kernel is a software term and... Kern is, kern. A, is a software term, yeah. And so that's where Akerna came from. I didn't know that. I'm not a software geek. I, I had no idea she is, uh, which is why she runs a software company. But I just thought that was super interesting, that little uh, bit of information. But to get back to this, what you just kind of talked about something about a growing segment. From, from what you've been seeing, what consumer segment is growing? So senior women is growing. Seniors in general are growing, but, but senior women are growing. What we see, another growing segment that's interesting that grows right at the shift of uh, the medical to the rec market is women. So women increase in size uh, in terms of the versus men uh, when you shift to the rec market. So if you're where we are, California, and the market is really still making that transition, you've got an opportunity to pick up new entrants, new consumers that are women. We track new, new entrants to the market. Uh, it's been about 9% a month uh, this year, and new is new to the legal cannabis market. We track those entrants. So the market is growing with new consumers, and our data can, can tell you who that is, where you live, because it might be different in Oregon versus California. Um, let me build on that. Uh, with the kind of data that you can develop and that um, solar sciences could enhance, one of the things you could do is ask new buyers directly, because if you have the, if you use the solar science um, icon of solar science uh, technology, uh, you, you can have a two-way conversation with the individuals. And you could ask the individuals a number of questions about the trigger that caused them or that finally tipped their scale to, for them to uh, come into the marketplace. Uh, was it a conversation with X? Was it some experience? Was it uh, some uh, issue that they were having in their life? What is the trigger that, that caused the people? How did they feel before and after uh, and during the, uh, the purchase experience. Those kinds of things uh, can, uh, can help you position your brand and build your brand. In consumer products, for example, for many products that are bought by uh, women who, who, who uh, work exclusively in the home, they're homemakers, one of the principal things that they're concerned about is assuring themselves that they're being a good mother. So the question that's often asked is, how do you feel about yourself when you serve this product? Well, those kinds of experiences and those kinds of answers you can only get when you have your data uh, augmented by some things that uh, so scientists can do uh, and that any a skilled researcher can do if you have the data. If you don't have the data, you can't make this up. Uh, the, I'm not a big fan of the uh, teachers union, but they have a great bumper sticker. And the bumper sticker is, if you think information and knowledge is expensive, try ignorance. There's nothing more expensive than ignorance, okay? And because you'll, you'll lose, as we say in Kentucky, your hat and your ass, okay? You, you, this is not a good experience. You know, uh, 
It's interesting because um, when we get to the big traditional CPG companies, you know, they've got teams that protect their product. Um, they can make sure that there's nobody selling fake frosted flakes or anything of that nature. You know, this has been um, an issue that has come to my attention not long ago about counterfeiting and protecting your brand. You know, what's the best way to protect your brand now that we're starting to have um, not only counterfeiting on the black market, because I, somebody told me that 80% of the black market is counterfeited products where they're actually uh, taking um, a cannabis brand and copying the labels and, and copying the, the product and, and selling it as if it was that product. You know, what, what can people do if they've got a brand and they're a small operation to protect it? I'm going to give you a self-serving answer. <laughs> that is, uh, uh, put the solo uh, image on your package because that's a way of saying to your shoppers, we care about your buying what you think you're buying, and this will assure that you are getting what you think you're getting. So it's a self-serving answer, but that's that's the best way you can. Well, are uh, the dispensaries getting behind that? Because I feel like when you go into a dispensary, there's no real, you know, support for them making sure that what, I, I mean, you assume that if you go in a Harborside or Midman or whatever, that the product that they've got on the shelf is the right thing. Um, but do we know that? Yeah, so this is really new technology in this partnership with um, Akerna and, and Solo Sciences. And I think in terms of answering your direct question, do dispensaries want to do that? Or are they doing that? I think a good number of them want to do it. Um, we've seen this across hemp and cannabis, uh, where people are really concerned as retailers to communicate to their um, their audience that their products are authentic, that their products are safe, that their products are coming from where they're coming from. And so the um, Quasar, the solo code that goes on the product that is a new, new, really a new technology and, and partnership that we're offering, communicates to consumers more than what's on the testing label. So if I buy some cannabis, I've got a testing label that tells me what the state says it has to tell me or tells me what the um, uh, retailer has, has paid for. So the state requires some things. It requires, you know, your milligrams, and it requires a few other things. And then other brands decide, I want to tell you more. I want to get tested for terpenes and tell you about terpenes. I want to tell you about some other things on this product. And the beauty of this, this Quasar code is you can... Um, those testing labels are limited in size, limited in what you can put on it, not very attractive. So this code can be branded to to uh, you know, match your packaging, to be the luxury experience you want it to be. And then the consumer can scan it with the app and learn as many things as you'd like to tell them about the chain of custody of that product, where it was grown, when it was grown, what nutrients were used to grow it, grow it, who harvested it, when it was processed into oil, what solvents were used, whether there were any cutting agents added to those solvents, all the things you might want to know and you might want to communicate to your consumers to assure them as we get more and more of either the counterfeiting or concerns about, I really want a transparency on, on what I'm smoking, what I'm consuming, and I want you to give all that information to me. How do you do that on a small package? How would you do that on a joint package? You can do that with this, with this solo code and uh, MJ Freeway, MJ Platform Integration. I know with uh, a lot of the vaping lately, we've seen some of the bigger companies come out with um, a press move, you know, where they've issued a, a press release saying, you can be sure that what we've got in our vape cartridges, there's no, you kind of mentioned the word filler, there's no um, added chemicals, it's this, that, and the other. And I, I felt that was really smart of them to get out front and ahead of it, because I feel like, you know, we were seeing this on the six o'clock news, and that's not a good thing, because I can't imagine what that was going to do to sales of um, THC vapes where I know, you know, they're coming from, uh, some of these products are coming from organic farms and, and I thought their message is going to get lost because people are just going to lump vape into, you know, all one big category. Um, you know, we kind of touched a little bit on the category of uh, women of a certain age being an emer uh, emerging consumer group. Um, what really is the, what are the products that are emerging? I know for a while there was all, microdose was the big thing. You know, is, is there a new, you know, product trend that we're seeing? Vapes. Yeah. So um, we find older consumers are, va are vaping a lot. Um, so vapes, we had yeah. to actually took a look at the data with the recent news in vaping and have seen just 
Tibet, um, no decline in vape sales um, in the cannabis legal market. So they've been growing steadily and really fast, and there's been no, no impact in sales with the recent news. You know, and I also kind of wonder if a lot of the vape troubles we were seeing were from kids that that suck on a jewel like every five minutes and then that's what's really hurting their lungs but then they kind of lump the whole THC vape into the category and we don't di know didn't and, differentiate it and that's part of the issue with you know the, a lot of these have been purchased on the illegal market there's no seed to sell tracking there's no compliance there's no way of knowing what's in those products and whether they're full of pesticides and that we don't know so purchase from the legal market and the What's special about cannabis that's surprising is the amount of transparency and accountability we're bringing to a consumer product good that's more than any other industry. You don't know what's happening with your tomatoes or your lotion or any other products you're consuming down to the level that we know with cannabis. I, you know, it's funny that you bring that up because I know um, now once you kind of get in your head that you're thinking about these uh, cannabis products that you're buying and down, drilling down to the farm it's coming from and such, uh, you can go in the grocery store and buy all kinds of foods that we have no idea where it's coming from. And when we had that whole E. coli thing with the lettuce, it took them weeks to figure out where that came from. And then when you get into um, pig farms, most of the farmers won't even let you onto their farm. They won't let the regulators onto the farm to, to figure out what's going on. So if you had that kind of data, you keep that from happening. Or you, if there is a problem, you determine it really quickly. But that also protects the brand because back to that point, if you've got the data to support that behind your brand, your brand has, once again, what Gordon was pointing to, trust. And I thought that that was a really amazing point that you made at the beginning was, you know, what is a brand, which is, seems like a basic question, but it was being able to trust in that product. And the, uh, think of the experience uh, when you have one of these quasars on the package and you have your own cell phone. So this is a level of trust and confidence because you, you've got your cell phone in your hand. You've got the app on your phone. You're not depending upon something printed on a package that may not be accurate, uh, that may not even be the package. Once you see the um, uh, quasar and, and you see it with the uh, cell phone that you're holding in your own hand, uh, it has a level of reinforcement for trust and confidence that is hard to get from almost any other experience. Jeanette, I'm curious, have people um, started down one road with a product and then started, uh, that you know of, that then once they saw the data, pivoted and went a different direction? Because I feel like maybe that that often happens, that y you fall in love with an idea, um, kind of in the, sample, the, the, the example I gave earlier, you fall in love with an idea because it came from you, so of course it has to be amazing. Um, and, and then sometimes I feel like maybe um, company leaders, even though they see the data, they just don't want to believe it because it was telling them that their idea maybe wasn't the greatest idea. Um, I feel like, you know, it may be hard sometimes for company leaders to get that data and, and then actually follow it. Yeah. I mean, it's important to get it in the beginning, to get your data, you, we've all said that, to collect that in the very beginning so you don't make those costly mistakes because building an operation, a cannabis operation around an idea is a really expensive proposition. So if your idea wasn't the right idea, the product wasn't the right product, that's, that's not gonna work. Usually, what, what, most of the time, most of the time, people have the product, right? What we see people making tweaks around is pricing. We see them making tweaks around formulations. Um, we see them innovating and moving to uh, a, new, a new way of producing their product. So live resin um, is the most popular kind of name for concentrates right now. So if you're buying a concentrate and you're thinking about types of concentrates, it's uh, hard to kind of 
call, what do you call live resin, but if you're thinking about um, what's popular with consumers among concentrates, if that's in the name, that's very popular. So that gives you uh, data to say, make tweaks to a product. We see more tweaking to say, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm producing a great concentrate from a great strain, but I really wanna be able to call it live resin, so I'm gonna change the way I produce this product in order to produce that type of concentrate because it's gotten very popular. Can the data give you, that? I mean, can the data drill you down into those types of it words, can. like it live can. resin? It can, and, it can. Yeah. And so we, we produced a guide around concentrates recently for 710. Live resin is the most popular uh, type of concentrate people are buying, but sauce, whatever you think of as sauce, because I, you know, you label it sauce and it might look one way, it might look another way, but it's growing. People are very excited to buy it. What is sauce? So it's a, <laughs> it's a, so sauce is a saucier concentrate. It's a little bit more liquidy and often it'll have diamonds or crystals in it mixed in with the sauce. Okay, and I've this heard is, of the crystals. This has become very popular. So are you still, but do you would, uh, and forgive me if I'm being ignorant I'm about this. I'm a personal this. fan when I'm not six months pregnant. Uh, <laughs> so, so are you, st do you put the sauce in a, in a, a dab? Yeah, you can dab, you dab it like you would dab anything else, any other concentrate. It's just a slightly different kind of Mix consistency, consistency, essentially. Okay. Um, and maybe there's other things, probably concentrate, you know, people out there, extraction artists who want to strangle me. Um, but yeah. And, and that, I could see where that could be kind of uh, where, again, this data is giving you that brand information because uh, when you get into that concentrate area and you got wax and crumble and shatter, um, who, how do you make yourself unique right. in that world? Right. And so I would tell you sauce. People are in love with sauce right now. So there, there you go. That's, that's the way to, to get something unique. I would also feel like you know, what we've seen in CPG as well, traditional CPG, is, is flavorings and, and, you know, how those trend go in and out. Flavorings and packaging. So in CPG, for sure, like established CPG, you think of Coca-Cola or um, Heinz, people have started innovating with packaging. How do you bring innovative packaging to the market? It's something probably everyone has seen or the new, if you go to Chick-fil-A, they have those packets of ketchup where you like open it this way, you kind of pull it down and dip or you squeeze. It's still just ketchup, but the packaging innovation turns out to be um, unique and interesting, and that's really helpful. And so we we capture packaging to understand what packages of joints sell better. Is it a three pack, a six pack, a two pack? Um, and then how do you innovate with packaging? How do you change your milligram? Um, your your up your milligrams or lower your milligrams? And a whole chocolate bar or a small chocolate bar? And there's so many things you can dial in to understand. This is the right package size or the growing package size for this segment. That uh, same experience that Jeanette was talking about exists across numerous product categories. The, the issue of packaging uh, and utilizing the right size, uh, take uh, Tied Pods, for example, uh, that is a function of the fact that women were not using, women who did the mocha laundry, were not using the proper amount of product, and therefore they were getting a suboptimal result, and, and not uh, insignificantly not making Procter & Gamble enough money because the consumer wasn't using enough. So this was a, seen by Procter as an everybody wins. We'll, we'll put them in a pod and give them the precise amount of product. Uh, it, in technical terms, it's builder and surfactant. Those are two driving uh, functions within a detergent. We'll give them that and we'll, we'll force them to use this. They'll get a better result, they'll be happier, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, unfortunately, children thought they were big candy and began to eat them, which is not uh, d desirable. And that gets to an issue of safety with, uh, with <laughs> cannabis. Uh, one of the things that we heard one of the ladies in the uh, previous uh, panel talk about uh, negative experience at different levels of potency. And um, this is going to cause a problem. I mean, this is a litigious society in which we live in. I'm sure that people are going to start suing everybody for everything. And, and one of the things, one of the ways that you can help to avoid that is by using a system similar to uh, what Akerna uh, is, is using and the, with the capabilities uh, and the assurance that can be provided by something like uh, the solo science uh, situation, because you can say, well, we, we told you this. this. This was what we told you. It was what we said it was. And, you know, you have some responsibility for X, Y, Z.
It, it's it, it's going to happen. And it kind of reminds me of, I had um, interviewed a, a gentleman that ran a company that does these uh, cartoon figurines, and they come in a square box. And whenever you go to Comic-Con, the biggest line on the floor is the people that are in line to get these limited edition figurines in these square boxes. And he had told me when he took over the company, um, they were floundering. They weren't doing very well. And one of the things that he implemented was he changed the packaging of these figurines because so many of the people that bought them were collectors. And he said, and they often didn't open the box of the toy. It's very much like, you know, 40-year virgin. And, um, and so he designed the boxes so that you could see the number of what the figurine was in the box and the number was on the top, the number was on the side, and the no it, he had it in specific spots so you could stack the boxes and still see them. You could stack them another way and still see them. And so the collectors were thrilled that they finally had what they had been looking for, which, and it was such a minor thing, blew the sales out because he made this simple change because he knew, again, that the data had told him that this was what people wanted and they weren't getting it from that company. Um, looking ahead, you know, um, what's this going to look like? You know, as I mean, you, you mentioned that we're really just kind of getting started on using data with cannabis. Where are we going? Well, we, we, we know what the future looks like. I mean, our objective is to create the uh, the symphony of data and of metrics that exist in uh, CPG today. And we can do that. We, we know what that looks like. What we have to do is begin to capture the data and, and then create the metrics. But we have the platonic idea of, the, of our aspiration. We, we know what that is. It's not new. It's been around for 20, 25 years. Uh, I want to go back briefly because I talk briefly about health effects. One of the positive things that's going to happen, especially in Utah, as people are given uh, cannabis for medical reasons, because they will have the Solo app and the Akerna data, uh, we'll be able to create uh, a and B panels, test panels for cancer patients and know what level of uh, of potency did what under what circumstances and put it into this in evolving set of data that's coming, uh, utilizing predictive analytics uh, to understand things like the progress of breast cancer and whether uh, how cannabis would interact with that, et cetera, et cetera. So the, this data has not only a, a recreational um, capability or function, but a dramatic uh, scientific uh, function. And, and if you know, A, that it's correct stuff, and B, you can assure that the, the uh, individual, the patient, or the, the test participant actually used the product that he or she was supposed to use. Do we have any questions? I think uh, we'd, we'd love to, to see if anybody has any questions for our panels. Oh. Yep, we have some questions. Some people are shy about asking questions because they think that it makes them stupid. Uh, I'm a reasonably smart pe person, and I ask a lot of questions because I don't know much of anything. So feel free to ask questions. I certainly won't consider it evidence of stupidity. I consider it evidence of intelligence. And if you don't want to talk about it here, please come and see Jeanette and me. We'll be roaming around here. Uh, and please come and see us and ask anything you want to. We'll, we're here to help. We want to advance the cause. And, and the best way we can do that is to share the information and experience we have. Fire away. Um, when it comes to predictive or prescriptive data, it's one thing to have the data in your stakeholder's hand. It's another for them to be able to extract the insight that it provides. How do you go about educating your stakeholders to become more data literate? So we have, um, I'll answer that for MJ Platform, you're right, it's one thing to collect data, it's a whole other thing to analyze the data and get insights out of the data that help you make good decisions. Those are miles apart from each other. Um, so we provide in, in the platform a visualization tool that does a lot of calculations for you. It gives you gross margin, it gives you um, 
sales. It gives you, um, you know, all the data you want about consumers. Uh, it tells you gender and age, et cetera, et cetera, all calculated for you. So you don't have to go slice. And then you can slice and dice it. You can slice that by product. You can slice that by category and uh, get your um, analysis there and really easy visual representations. It's not going to give you everything, but you can build your own dashboards and tools and then, you know, at least have a one-time consultation with us to build it or anyone else and then have this data refreshed every 15 minutes for you to come back to and answer those key questions. And I would also tell you start somewhere, start with a couple of questions you want to answer and then build from there. It can get overwhelming because there is so much data collected. Start with a couple of questions and go from there, but we do provide visualizations that make it a lot easier to answer, take data and turn it into insights. Um, the issue is what are the questions? We, people always worry about the answers, but the answers, you can only get the right answer if you ask the right question. So it helps if you ask yourself, what is the problem I am trying to solve? What is the question I am trying to answer? or what question, if answered, would put jingles into my jeans? Uh, those are the, that's where you start. Uh, then uh, we developed a concept called analytical pathways, which is if the, if the question you're trying to solve is this, here are the, here's the order of operations in math geek terms. Here's the order of operations you need to do to get you that answer. Uh, we, uh, many years ago, uh, put these issues up in uh, algorithms uh, on the, uh, computers of uh, IRI, uh, Information Resources, and Nielsen, who are the two principal providers of uh, POS data and other kinds of data in the consumer package industry. So w when a person asks a question, uh, they, we already had the pathway to the answer. In fact, Nielsen called the, that product Nielsen Answers. Another question? Um, so what are, me personally, I haven't come across any system that integrates fully with metric, but what are things that a lot of the uh, software systems, um, relations with the regulatory systems, what are you guys doing to it? Because I know there's a lot of information that the regulatory systems will not give. And a lot of that information could be very helpful to the industry. Um, and I really definitely see that that would be a benefit to the software program. So I'm trying to figure out like how are you guys relating with the, the governments and the various different states and these regulatory systems? So um, we're actually, plug for us, fully integrated into metric in nine states. Um, but I can't say that, I don't think that's true for California yet. Um, that being said though, what the state systems collect is much less data than what's usually collected by the seed to sell software. So a, the seed to sell software is gonna be a better source for, for data because there's gonna be usually more data and richer data, but I say, I say usually and it might not be usually. With our software, it's much, much richer. We collect a lot of data. It makes us, someone asked me about what's the difference between your software and other softwares earlier. It makes us a little, um, uh, we're not as simple to use because we're asking you to enter more data, but that data is so much more valuable to you. You can answer so many more questions than you can with what's, what's only required to be collected by metric is not going to answer your questions. So that's your point you're pointing out. You got to move over to a seed to sell software and then assess if you're really about the data, assess which one of these systems collects the most data I can use. That's the real value. Metric's going to make you track some stuff or wherever you are, whatever state you're in. That data is great, great for them. It tells them about taxes and it helps them come out when they inspect you. You need a lot different data about cost of goods, about uh, your consumers that you're gonna get out of a proper seed to sale software. So circling back to um, brand uniqueness for a second, you were saying that it's very important for the brand to be unique and to be authentic. But you're also talking about pivoting a little bit and identifying a market share that, hey, you may need to go over here. How do you square those things with your client if there's a conflict? Well, I think it has to be squared. You know, you look at where the opportunity is and you say, this works for us and for our brand or this doesn't. If that's, what, that's where the magic is. We, I would never tell you to not be authentic. Um, you've got to figure out this, this growing segment makes sense for us as well. We can do this well. Anyone else? There, there are uh, less expensive research techniques you can use. I mean, I'm, I would be shocked if people hadn't been using 
uh, something like a focus group where you can bring in users or non-users, as the case may be, of various products and simply ask them and ask them you know, why they're doing X and why they're doing Y. Uh, you can even create products and uh, uh, throw them out on the, on the table and ask the people, uh, what about this product? Here's what this product does. How, how would you visualize that? Some people use uh, quantitative scoring techniques after they have a, a focus group where they'll show people uh, a, a particular uh, product idea uh, with various uh, attributes and then uh, score it. And it doesn't take much money uh, to uh, collect a bunch of folks, uh, and you don't need a whole, a whole lot of uh, people or respondents to get some idea. It helps you more on, what, on, on getting rid of the bad ideas than finding the really super ideas, but I've seen people literally find super ideas in focus groups. Uh, one of them I can remember very specifically was in uh, 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 infant diapers, but that's another story. So it, it can, there, are, there are simple, less expensive research techniques that, that you can uh, use. All right, well, um, one more question. I see someone back there. Do these same principles apply when you're selling, like, do these same principles apply when you're selling uh, raw materials to the, the manufacturer? I would think so, because I would think that there's, you know, whether there's trend is towards organic or uh, certain strains. I mean, building an authentic brand is going to apply even, I think, to raw materials. Um, and there's, what raw material is it? And I could tell you what data you could collect or use. I mean, it, de it really depends, but I bet there's some data we could give you that would be useful for you as well. Like biomass. The biomass? Biomass and hemp. Okay, yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, what you're going to want to know, this is how where I would, you're telling me you're selling biomass. Um, you're going to want to know, my guess would be um, what, what's it going to be used for? What are the growing trends in the finished goods that your product would go into? And that would help you figure out what's the right raw material to sell. And pricing. Yeah, yes, and pricing. So you, yeah, thank you, Deborah, because you want to be priced where it's attractive for them based on what their end retail price is. And again, there are cheap uh, ways to evaluate pricing. We can talk about them later. Are we almost done here? I, I just want to thank you on behalf of Solo Sciences for uh, tolerating us, or at least me, and uh, uh, both Jeanette and I will be here and be more than willing uh, to answer any questions that uh, you might feel more comfortable in asking in a one-on-one -on -one situation. Thank you very much. Yes, Thanks, thank you. Jeanette. We Thanks, actually Gordon. have a fact sheet in your folder that you got with some other data tidbits like the 9% new consumer entrance and that senior women are growing. So if you're interested, take a look at that. All right. Uh, we'll be queuing up our next panel. Bigger is not always better. You know, we've got, um, we've had about 200 of, yes. <laughs>